you so much, Kerlach. I am delighted to be here today to mark Europe Day and speak to the many benefits that we have felt through our membership of the European Union. Today is also an opportunity to reflect on how far we have come over the past half century. This afternoon I will speak to the transformative effect EU membership has had on our country, the benefits accrued through previous waves of enlargement for all of us, as well as the potential of future enlargement. I will also touch on the EU's approach to migration. Ireland's membership of the EU has been transformative. Our country is almost unrecognisable from what it once was. The economic, social and political shifts over the past five decades have been nothing short of seismic. And our 50th anniversary gave us an opportunity to reflect on Ireland's membership of the EU and the many changes that we saw since 1973. And when we joined the, Euro the then European communities, Ireland was one of the poorest countries in Western Europe. We were independent for just five decades and still quite inward looking. Our voice, such as it was, was small. It was in a world dominated by very large states and we were a small and at that time relatively poor island off the coast of Europe and had little opportunity to, to have ourselves, to make our voice heard. Membership of the European communities and later the European Union amplified our voice on the world stage and in the process it gave us the confidence to, 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 to seek out uh, different ways of our amplifying our voice. It gave us the impetus to strengthen our own human rights record, to drive forward civil and social rights, to introduce gender equality legislation, to improve the protection of workers' rights and rights of minorities and to become a much more tolerant, kinder and inclusive Ireland than the Ireland of 1972. And the people of Ireland rec consistently recognise this reality. I was so pleased this week to see the data from the European Movement of Ireland that the, in their poll, which showed that 84% of people in Ireland believe we should remain a member of the European Union. An overwhelming endorsement of the Union, its values and achievements. Today, on Europe Day, we reflect on the progress that we have made consolidating peace, prosperity and democracy across the European continent. But we know that our task is still not complete, that our union is still not whole. 50 years ago, Ireland benefited from the EU's very first enlargement, and that last half century of EU membership has transformed Ireland. And we believe that every European country transitioning from, you know, to democracy and transitioning to, to, a more, to the European values, every country deserves the same opportunity, provided, of course, that they meet the necessary criteria for membership. We welcome the European Council's decisions in March to open accession negotiations with Bosnia-Herzegovina and to take forward the work of accession of Ukraine and Moldova. We believe those were the right decisions, we advocated strongly for them, and they were, they were right decisions based on the progress in the reforms that we have seen in all three countries since the previous European Council conversation about that in December 2023. It is vitally important that all candidate countries continue to seize the current momentum on enlargement by making rapid and meaningful reforms on accession reforms. And just in the past couple of weeks, the General Affairs Council had the opportunity to meet with all of the accession countries and to hear the different opportunities and challenges that they're facing as they implement rule of law and other changes to help move them along the accession process. And the reforms obviously have to be driven within the candidate countries themselves. And the EU does have a number of tools at its disposal to help with the implementation of those reforms, but the countries have to do it themselves. But the, you know, the EU does try to support that, and the most recent addition to that toolbox is the new growth plan for the Western Balkans, which involves a €6 billion Euro investment to bring the region closer to the EU and to boost the regional economy. On a bilateral level, Ireland is playing its part in increasing engagement on enlargement. So, for example, next year we will open new embassies in Belgrade, Sarajevo and Chisneau, enabling us to, be, to more proactively assist the th three candidate countries. We have also established a new enlargement fund, allowing us to provide technical support to candidates in preparation for their eventual EU membership. Ireland will continue to be a voice in support of enlargement in, in, in every way, in, in every practical way and political way that we can. At the end of the day, I believe the EU's entire future will benefit from enlargement by allowing more people to work together in prosperity pro and, pro and progress and peace. But if you look at the benefit of the 2004 enlargement and other enlargements, it has been that Irish people and Irish companies have the benefit of being able to trade in those countries, that we have more countries that are within the European construct of the democracy, the rule of law, and we are able to maintain those relationships and maintain uh, that progress for those states uh, rather than risk anything else. So it's really very important and this next wave of enlargement provides a similar opportunity for Ireland as much as Europe. I do know that migration is a key concern of issue for, public, for the public and that irregular migration remains an enormous challenge for the EU and its member states. 
The challenges it presents cannot be effectively addressed by any state acting alone, particularly where numbers of irregular arrivals are continually increasing across the EU and Ireland for different reasons such as climate um, difficulties and of course geo increasing geopolitical instability. Intergovernmental regional dialogues and mutually beneficial partnerships remain essential to achieving long-lasting results in the better management of the different migratory pressures, including in relation to the external dimensions of migration. So we favour intensifying cooperation with the countries of origin and transit in order to prevent loss of life and to reduce pressure on European borders. And that should be done in full transparency, embedding human rights in the relationship to balance the partnership and to ensure that implementation is in line with international law. Cooperation on return and readmission remains a priority also to improve the effectiveness of the EU return policy. Sustainable reintegration and promoting the option of voluntary return are key components. And Ireland welcomed the political agreement reached in December last year between the EU co-legislators regarding the outstanding EU uh, migration and asylum pact measures. And of course, the recent vote in the European Parliament um, passing all measures of that pact. Ireland is firmly of the view that Europe must address the shared challenge of unplanned migration through collective effort. We have always supported a predictable and flexible system of responsibility and solidarity with regard to reception and management of protection applicants. And in that context, the pact is a really significant improvement on the current system. As senators will be aware, the government recently approved opting in to the non-Schengen measures contained in the pact. And subject to the approval of both of these houses, which will be formally sought within the coming weeks, it is hoped that Ireland can opt into the pact and work with other EU member states to implement the substantial reforms. Ultimately, we know that migration requires a humane, but comprehensive and coordinated European response. <clears throat> like all of our friends and partners in Europe, we do find ourselves in an increasingly contested and volatile global environment. And in particular, Russia's brutal and illegal invasion of Ukraine has clearly had a fundamental impact on Europe's security, including uh, on that uh, of Ireland. Simply put, we really just cannot no, any longer rely on our either geographic isolation for our security, nor do, can we believe with any seriousness that we can insulate ourselves from world events. And for that reason, the government is committed to broadening and deepening Ireland's international security engagement, as well as our domestic efforts to secure, to ensure the security of our country. Firstly, and as the EU has made clear, we know that Russia has demonstrated a continuous pattern of irresponsible behaviour in cyberspace, notably by targeting democratic institutions, government entities, critical infrastructure providers, both across the EU and beyond. On the 3rd of May, Ireland joined EU member states in strongly condemning the latest malicious cyber campaign conducted by Russian-controlled actors against democratic processes in Germany and, Czech and Czechia. As we underlined with our partners, this type of behaviour is not only contrary to UN norms of responsible state behaviour in cyberspace, but it's also in clear contravention of international law. And secondly, we know that certain foreign governments, including Russia, have deliberately and strategically targeted European societies with false and manipulated information. The objective of this activity, much of it online, is to generate confusion, to sow or amplify division and fear, and to undermine trust in government and democratic institutions. There are a number of important initiatives underway at EU level to combat that activity, including through new EU toolboxes on hybrid threats and foreign information manipulation and interference, all of which Ireland engages with and fully supports. And that work is complemented by the EU Digital Services Act, the powers for which came into operation in February 24. At a domestic level here in Ireland, the state obviously is also committed to protecting our democratic processes and ensuring the integrity of our elections, but we must be aware of the external threat. In particular, I know the Electoral Commission is working to ensure fairness and integrity in Ireland's democratic processes, including by preventing foreign information manipulation and interference, or by attempting to. The government is also committed to publishing a national counter disinformation strategy later this year to coordinate a whole of society approach to try to combat the harmful effects of disinformation. While there are no plans, as we know, to implement, to alter our policy of military neutrality, it is, though, incumbent on us to take our own security and our own responsibility towards our like-minded partners, particularly our fellow EU members, more seriously than ever before. Neutrality does not mean to have no ability to protect oneself, to not to protect our own sovereignty. And the investment in our defence forces is an absolutely crucial part of this. Um, I do look forward to hearing the members, uh, the views of senators here today, and I really do thank them for their ongoing interest in the political and democratic union that we have helped shape since 1973. As we're running ahead of schedule, I 
be lenient with you if you Thank wish you. to. I appreciate that because I do wish to respond to the excellent debate and to the, the, the contributions that have been made and I wish to respond as well as I possibly can. Um, and so you'll forgive me if I might jump from one thing to another, but it is in an effort to actually respond to what you've said. And I may start with Senator Higgins simply because it seems like the most logical response respectfully to you. And I think what you're saying is, <coughs> is, is exactly right in so many ways, but constrained by the practicality of some of the different particular challenges of the day and of the jurisdiction. So I agree with you and I am so proud that Ireland is a post-colonial society that has never invaded anybody, that has never profited or benefited from the largesse of any other part of the world, that has never uh, performed acts of cruelty to any other part of the world and that we do not have ornate buildings around Ireland that have been funded by the profits of that sort of activity and I'm so proud that that is so. And it gives us a different standing in the world. It gives us a different standing mor morally. It gives us a different standing in diplomacy and it gives us a different standing diplomatically. And it gives us a very different perspective that we continue to try to bring in everything that we do, a humanitarian perspective that we try to bring in everything that we do. I do think it is one of the reasons, as other senators have said, I think it was Senator Moynihan who said that, you know, our, and Senator Ward, of course, Senator, our post-colonial experience informs our particular perspective on the conflict in the Middle East, and I might come back to that, but it's just that it's an, it's an important link. Our question of, the question of neutrality, which has been touched on by yourself and indeed by Senator Crockwell, I sort of sit, if I might explain my, my thinking in relation to it, it's very, very important that Ireland has been militarily non-aligned. Of course, we haven't had to participate. We have had se sentences here correctly, like we, as Senator Byrne said, that we have had the longest continuous democracy. And that is true, and that is because we have protected and preserved the political institutions of this state, that we've protected and preserved elections in this state. But it is also because we didn't participate in World War II. And that is a different question of the day, but it is also a historical moral question that we could ask ourselves about how we didn't participate in, you know, stopping a very different genocide at that time. And that is a question that, that we might reflect on. And, you know, we did rely at, at times on other people to, to, to support our effort at neutrality at that. But, you know, it wasn't, I'm not sure that was the best moral decision either. The, um, the neutrality, and I appreciate what Senator Crockwell is saying about the different words that we use, whether it's militarily non being non-aligned, and I completely agree with that. We are not politically neutral, and I appreciate that he is criticising myself and others for using these phrases interchangeably, and that may be so. Let's, let's put that aside. Let's speak about the principles rather than the words. We are very much in favour of democratic norms, the rule of law, and societies that either have those or are aspiring to implement those, particularly those societies like Ukraine, like Moldova, like Kosovo, like um, all the countries across the Western Balkans that are struggling with the transition to democracy, both because that is a difficult thing to do and because of the contextual difficulties, such as trying to implement major rule of law reforms in the face of very significant entrenched organised crime. It is very difficult to do. And I met my counterpart from, many, from those different countries at the General Affairs Council. I met a number of them, met my counterparts, and they are really struggling with those different challenges. But I also met my colleagues from Estonia, from Lithuania, from Finland, all of whom, particularly Estonia and Lithuania, who have made the transition to democracy, who are entirely committed to the democratic project, entirely committed to rule of law, which I think these are, when we speak about the principles at the centre of the project that we share, they are about humanity, but they are also the principles of democracy and the rule of law. These are the principles, as you say, principles rather than interests that we can wrap around, that I think Ireland wants to wrap around. But the strategic fact is that the principles that they are trying to uphold in Lithuania and Estonia are being strategically attacked by a different force by Russia. And so the particular both jurisdictional and situational context that they face in which they are trying to consider their armament, the amount of money that they're spending on defence is not because they wish to. It's being ramped up that quickly because they are looking at the principles that they have gone through in terms of transition from the Soviet Union to democracies, to the European Union, and now seeing them very much under threat. Under threat through the weaponized migration, the weaponized, the instrumentalized, weaponized pushing over of migrants by Russian, Russian and, and, and aligned actors, by the continuous threats, I mean, hundreds of cyber attacks 
a day is what's being reported to me from those colleagues by the continual efforts to disrupt their democracies time and time and time again through disinformation. And it is just a different situational context. And in that sense, it is in that context that the defence conversation and the security conversation has come to the fore as one of the top three European priorities. Not because I believe Europe is trying to articulate a set or articulate or defend a set of interests, but because it has no choice at this moment. And I think Ireland, as a continuous democracy, as somebody who's come from post-colonial uh, state to defend democratic institutions and the rule of law on a pan-European basis, who has seen the benefit of that to our state. And I thought what Senator Ward said in relation to the real capturing of our sovereignty through the European Union, not in spite of the European Union, was so poignant and so important. But that Ireland's position in that has to be closer within that European perspective to understand that we both need to use Europe to properly defend ourselves in terms of our own national security, and if that means participating in structures where we can get quicker or cheaper access to the tools that our defence forces need to defend ourselves, both physically and from cyber attack, then I believe that that is an appropriate thing that we would do. We did the same thing in relation to the protection of our people from COVID in terms of the sharing of access to vaccines and the advantage that we get through shared cooperation. We are not talking about buying things to go and attack people. We are talking about participating to be able to defend ourselves because Senator Crockwell is correct when he says that we are not we are not properly equipped as a defence forces, that the defence forces do need more support. Senator Byrne said it all, Senator Ward said it also that we need the capital investment and the access to, and it is difficult, the supply chains are very difficult at the moment, and the reason that the supply chains are difficult is because so much is being used in Ukraine, that the equipment simply isn't there precisely because it is being used by an, a country, a transitional country that is trying, has tried to be a democratic state, is being a democratic state, is committed to the rule of law, and is being attacked by an actor that simply wants to destroy not just the, that country's effort, but Europe's effort to protect and extend democracy, extend the European family closer and closer to Russia and the principles that, that all of that in, includes. So I just think, I agree with, with Senator Higgins and in, um, in relation to so many of these things, but I don't think what we're saying is contradictory. I think the situational jurisdictional context is, 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 extremely, is extremely important. If I might touch on Senator, what Senator Moynihan has said in relation to Gaza, and she is correct, of course, about our moral leadership. And again, what I'm saying about our post-colonial experience infor informs some of that. But I would, I would say, and I know she has acknowledged this, that it is Ireland's position that, has, that the European Union has come to in relation to the ceasefire. That it is Ireland, of course, alone, that is advocating uh, another, a, a review, an urgent review, which Taoiseach Leo Radker uh, wrote to the... To the um, to President von der Leyen about a joint review with, with, President, uh, with uh, Prime Minister Sanchez on the 14th of February last year. I was with Taoiseach Simon Harris at the, uh, in the fringes of the European Council meeting last month where he then made that point again. And there hasn't been a response. But in the same way, Ireland has stood up and wants to recognise the state of Palestine. And we're not delaying that for any casual reason. It is to try to have the best way of doing that, as has been said. And it is Ireland that is, trying, that is doing that from its experience. And it is moderates, moderates, it will always be moderates, it will never be Hamas, who can never be excused for what they've done. And neither can the Netanyahu government ever be excused from what they've done. But it will be the moderate Democrats in Israel and the moderates in Palestine who will bring this peace process, who will bring this political path, which is what we support, international institutions, the rule of law, democracy, and a humanitarian underpinning of all of the different things that that we are doing. And it is those moderates who will bring us, I hope, in the way that Senator Higgins has described Germany and France and their coalescence around coal and steel. At that time, wars were entirely determined by who had the most steel. That was it. Of course, that's changed since. But it was that alignment of coal and steel. As, as, was it yourself or as Senator Moynihan? Forgive me, I've, I've made a mistake. Um, I said incorrectly in the Dáil uh, yesterday that yesterday was 80 years since Victory in Europe Day. It was, of course, 79 years. Next year is, is 80 years. But today is Europe Day, and it's such an important day to recognise Ireland's place in Europe, Ireland's place in the world. I really think what Senator Ward has said about the enhancement of our sovereignty through Europe was so important. It's not a context I had thought about in terms of the currency and the precedence. You're entirely right. It's, it's extremely important. And I think, Senator, what I, if, I, if I might finish by saying that I think Senator Byrne's idea about 18 year olds travelling. It might seem like a long way away, but so did the idea of Europe. And it is such a wonderful expression of enabling our young people to understand and see the shared values, the different cultural experiences, and the very different places that we have all come from and yet come together to be able to create a shared, collective, consensual Europe. And I think it's a fantastic idea.
Oh, and if I might say to Central Cockrell, I was actually in the Department of Defence. I had gone in to meet the senior management on my second day. I just took a photograph outside. That's, you know, I don't go to take photographs in places. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Minister, and I thank all senators.